You all knew this was coming. Ugh, that thing is way too heavy. Let's get a bit lighter today, shall we? Ozzy! My first video was kicked off with these words, but I'll say it again. Persona- No, not those words! Persona is a series which I adore, to the point that it almost feels tied to my identity at this point. Every one of these games soars above the average RPG, connecting with the players in ways many other games seemingly can't. Maybe it's the fleshed out and realistic characters, or the down-to-earth plots and themes that drive each game to be their best. Or it's the cute girls, but I digress. These games have a unique way of striking a chord with its fans. As you may know, I <coughs> recently made a video criticizing what I considered to be the biggest drop in quality in Persona 5, and my conclusion was that the palace may have been mediocre when compared to the rest of the game, and it only proves to demonstrate how fantastic this game truly is at its peak. So let's talk about that peak, shall we? Massive spoilers for the game up to this point, but you knew that already. Still, if you haven't played P5 yet, I implore you to give it a chance before watching this. Regardless, I've waited long enough. It's time to explain why Persona 5's Casino Palace is the best. Y you get it? It's, it's like the title of the video! Let's start things off where we left off with the last palace, with the death of the ever-wondrous Kunikazu Okumura. Just to give clarity on why this moment is a fantastic launching off point for this arc, we have to look back at the setup granted by the last palace. Okumura was a public figure thrust onto the fansite forums with seemingly no rhyme or reason. Yes, he was a terrible man and a corporate tyrant, but the mass flooding of requests was a bit too conspicuous for the average target. However, they weren't surprised to figure out he actually did have a palace, so what would be the harm in it? Uh, a lot, actually. Ignoring the drama that ensued as the Phantom Thieves debated how they would handle this target, the setup here shows that something is clearly wrong with these circumstances. Heck, I know I criticized this to bits in my last video, but you could argue that the distortion being a space station is only meant to further the idea that this palace doesn't belong, and that there's something off about this whole scenario. Despite all this, they take down Okumura, recruit the most adorable foosball you've ever seen, and they head out to celebrate at Disney and Mean Destinyland to commemorate the occasion. What could possibly go wrong? Well, that's less than ideal. As promised by the build-up, the thieves have more or less been framed for the death of Okumura. Or were they? One aspect people seem to undervalue is that the team legitimately has no clue what just occurred. Of course, we do, having seen Black Mask shoot the man straight in his space dome. But as far as they know, they could have simply made a mistake in how they handled the palace, a mistake that cost the life of Haru's father. Now, I'd personally make the argument that the narrative could have potentially been stronger if the Thieves didn't mostly drop the idea that this was their fault within a week's time, and also if we as the audience didn't see what had happened to Okumura prior. But as things are presented, I'd say the impact still lands. With this, favor from the public instantly shifts. The Thieves are practically terrorists in the eyes of the world due to what is perceived as a cold murder plot. Suddenly, so many pieces from earlier in the game are placed down to heighten the stakes. Sai is finally aware of the tampering on her computer and is fully ready to take down the thieves once and for all. The Black Mask Killer is finally emerging from the shadows, Igor is still acting sus, and even the death of Principal Eggman is starting to become relevant. On top of that, Sai's future interrogation of you is becoming more intense by the second, and the date on the calendar makes it clear that you're nearing the fate promised you at the beginning. It's a lot, and the pressure is readying us for an explosion sometime soon. And that explosion is especially apparent when Sai reveals the target of your last palace exploit. It was addressed to Sai Nijima. Myself. Now, explain everything to me. Ah! 
This plot makes me want to squeal like a little girl during the opioid epidemic, but I must contain myself. This is only the setup for what's to come. Oh, so we're gonna ignore all the SIU director stuff because literally who gives a crap? The thieves begin to theorize about a grand conspiracy in the making, all destined to set them up as villains against the nation. Meanwhile, they can't relax in their own hideout without the sound of a politician's speeches booming through their walls. I wonder if that's relevant at all. Hmm. The team is understandably anxious that they're playing directly into the hands of their hidden enemies, yet insist on staying vigilant and striking back against their assailants. Sai is tasked with tackling the Phantom Thieves case by and she vows not to let him down. They can't risk this failure. Sai goes home, she and Makoto have another bout of sisterly discourse, and tensions rise even more. By now, the cops are even investigating students at Shujin itself, and Okay, I don't need to keep saying this, but take my word for it that every plot point is only designed to intensify things more and more. As to not gain suspicion when gathering up, Makoto suggests that a few of them join the school festival committee so that they have a proper reason to meet up often. As they count the student votes for a celebrity guest, the ballot box reveals their choice to be... <laughs> Keanu Reeves! Hey, Everyone loves Keanu! This is awesome! Wait, what? Goro Akechi? Who the heck would want that simp detective at their fest? You head home, the aforementioned detective ranting about you guys on CNN, and the team readies themselves for a discussion about how to best approach the coming days. What are you staring at your phone like that for? Oh, are you going through a breakup? I love this man. The team meets up and agrees to invite Akechi as the guest star of the festival, Makoto's reasoning being that they can use him as a useful source of insider info. It's risky, but necessary in their position. Akechi considers it, Joker goes to the cafe, sees Akechi, says the BEST LINE IN THIS GOSH DARN GAME, and a certain familiar figure appears on the news, ranting his heart out about his political values. Remember everything coming together here? Yeah, it's still building. Akechi makes it apparent that he believes the Phantom Thieves are at least somewhat moral, and officially agrees to attend the festival. And so the festival begins. The group has a grand old time, Ryuji yells at some maids, Akechi eats a fireball, and... No, no, I can't overlook that scene. I'm going to have one of these. <gasps> the special one! Let's just call this my performance fee. But... It's fine. Hmm. It's quite the... <clears throat> my throat. This is... Oh, my stomach. <clears throat> It burns! I, 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 I'm... I'm fine! I, I just love, uh... Spicy... Spicy stuff. <laughs> yes! Yes! Suffer! <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, so... Persona is a series of games that I- The following day, the Goro Akechi Happy Fun Time panel begins, and the dude makes the same group of giddy girls laugh for five hours straight. Makoto interrogates him for info on stage, which would normally seem sus if it wasn't Makoto talking. And then, he reveals that he may actually know who the Phantom Thieves truly are. Nearly about to expose their names on stage, he creates a diversion and calls for a meeting with the thieves in a separate room. It's explained that not only does he know about the metaverse, and even further, he's been transported there before, but also he has the same power to wield personas as they do. And on top of that, he has seen the Black Mask Killer before and was attacked by them. Akechi proposes a deal with the team, or rather, a sort of blackmail. They help him clear their name, or he reports them to the police. This is an odd ultimatum, but it becomes clear why he suggests this when he reveals who the target is, that being Sai Nijima. Sai and her agency are described as prosecutors ready to put the metaphorical gun to the thieves' heads if they're ever caught, even willing to lie and cheat in the courtroom if need be, all to get their desired conviction. As this goes against the catchy's sense of justice, he knows this needs to be stopped. But also going along with his justice, he makes them promise to disband their group after all of this is resolved. So, yes. As with every palace prior, this one is partly dedicated to the newest, finest, and final member of the Phantom Thieves, Goro Akechi. Your ideological rival, who has symbolically stood against you this entire game, is finally here at the climax to merge your causes. And I love it. This plays into the narrative so well, especially once this palace ends and... Oh, my memory is fuzzy. 
I can't recall what I was gonna say here, but uh, let's carry on, shall we? I hope you all continue to pay attention to what happens. Once you get home, Sojuro learns that both you and Futaba are involved with the Phantom Thieves. Futaba starts to cry, Sojuro starts to cry, they all figuratively hug, and then I start to cry because of how great this scene is. The thieves reconvene and come to terms with the fact that they had been set up for the last few months or so, playing right into the hands of their enemies. They've been so caught up in trying to make the name of their group popular that they ended up abandoning the genuine nature of their sense of justice. Yes, it's not just Ryuji who liked being a phantom thief for the sake of popularity. You can stop harping on him now! They consider stopping their thief duty altogether, but Joker reaffirms that they need to finish what they started on the best note possible. The stakes just keep building and building. They talk with Akeji for a bit, and he admits to them that his main motivation isn't even the betterment of society per se, but his own obsessive grudge against some unnamed individual. And this moment really reflects on the others, and shows how Akechi is one of them in a sense. Ryuji and On with Kamashita, Yusuke with Madarame, Makoto with Kanashi. well, you get my point. He admits his own flaws and personal motives, yet is willing to spin them towards pursuing the best justice he can perceive. Basically, we love Akechi. Give him a hug, pal. He's one of us. <laughs> Sorry, I just got a niche on my nose. Um, uh, Akechi, what a lad! Things fast forward once more, and the drugs you were given by the police start to take a dreary effect on you. Sai is stressed enough in seeing how everything reached this point, but we're obviously getting ahead of ourselves here. The thieves talk a bit, Joker is on some more memory fuzzy drugs, Futaba steals Akechi's phone to play Clash of Clans, and the courthouse is revealed to be a casino. You know, a casino, like when... Yeah, that. Welcome to the climax. They all enter the palace and Akechi's costume is revealed, being what he perceives as someone who sticks to their justice, it being a near polar opposite to Joker's costume. It probably means nothing. As they sneak around, they're almost immediately spotted by Shadow Sai, which, ooh, 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 we'll get to this later. Shadow Sai proceeds to tell them exactly where her treasure is. This is odd, but she explains that this is in order to keep this game of theirs fair. AKA she's a dirty liar with a massive bluff up her sleeve. Just like your average poker player. Not revealing your full hand, but making a strong bluff from the start. Akechi finally reveals his persona, it being the esteemed Robin Hood, his aesthetic bright and show-offish with a superhero aesthetic to boot. His sword is also a lightsaber, which is odd, but really freaking cool! Listen, I really like Akechi. So the team goes up and through the palace, gambling their hearts out to this infinitely rigged game and stockpiling on poker chips in the process. Midway through, you have to visit one of Sai's IRL trials and t post to assert dominance before the next level of the palace can be opened. A small scene, but entertaining nonetheless. Finally, the day has come. It's time to liberate Sai Nijima from her distorted desires, with the calling card sent and your crew of loyal allies right at your side. Life will change is booming, and the peak of the climax is growing nearer. You can just feel it. The team goes inside, Sai conveniently opening up a door for you to ready your fated meeting. As you move in and go up the elevator, it suddenly vanishes behind you and a monitor switches on, the antagonizing mistress taunting you. Her various games have all built up to Sai's personal arena. She speaks of her father, someone who died for the sake of honest justice, yet leaving her to deal with the aftermath with his passing. All his discarded responsibilities were thrust onto her, adding all the pressure imaginable. Justice is only worthwhile at her own benefit by now. She will win at this game, and at life, no matter the cost. Now, why don't we begin? What? What is this? A clash of brute strength is simply uncalled for on this stage. What is she intending? No more coins or playing games! We ain't following your damn rules! Oh, you will. There is no room for negotiation. You will know soon enough. What was that? Now, come at me! You'll save her, right? All right, everyone! Be on alert! <laughs> I had to play that in full. 
Despite my attempts, no words can fully describe how tense this encounter is, and the dozens on top of dozens of hours you've invested are finally paying off in this confrontation. There's an energy to the standoff that likely hasn't been felt since the fight with Kamashita way back when, and even with this amazing setup and how well everything has been built up, we still aren't at the peak. Enough stalling though, I'll bring you there soon enough. The fight against the Decolite Endowed Roulette Queen comes to a close. Her quest to win at all costs has been undermined. Finally, she concedes. Makoto has a deep talk with her sister, allowing us proper closure on this confrontation, unlike some palaces, and everyone allows themselves a moan of solace as Ryuji and Yusuke retrieve the treasure off screen. Akechi and Joker have a bonding moment, and the team fully agrees that this is their last outing as the Phantom Thieves, as previously promised. Then, Enemy readings! When did they- An ambush. The shadows are freaking out still, and reinforcements seem to be lining the outside of the casino in droves. In order to assure that his friends escape, Joker takes the treasure they retrieved and books it on his own as a distraction. And thus, we get all caught up to the teased timeline of events. You all knew this would happen, and it's even better than expected. The same cutscene from the start of the game plays, this time with a new backing track that ups the intense nature of the scene as you have a wholly new context to the sequence. As you run through, more experienced with the game than ever, Arsene returns to you as promised, symbolizing your true spirit of rebellion as he stays with you for this final foray as themes. Everything has come full circle, hasn't it? Even though you know how this ends, few moments in the game feel so triumphant. Despite all that's about to happen, you've managed to help so many people up to this point, and you know that this tale of yours has to convince Sai in the present. And yet, despite all of that... teammate to thank for this. You were sold out. A traitor, huh? You're met once again in the Velvet Room. Caroline and Justine give you a boost of constructive motivation? They're betting on your chances of success, as is Igor. As they suggest, you must reflect on your bonds with your allies. Sai talks with you more in the real world, finally convinced of your exploits in the metaverse. Still, she grills you fully and gives you an ultimatum, still wishing to punish you aptly for shaking up the establishment of this country. She lists off the names of all of your allies, asking if they're involved in this group. Will you sell them out, or protect them through your own selfless vigilance? Well, obviously. You'll sell them out, duh! Yeah, I remember what you did, Ryan! I'm calling you out right here! Why would you sell out your friends after all that happened? You have to do <clears throat> Uh, I mean, you choose to protect your allies and take the fall. The final stand you take for the sake of your justice. You have the chance to lighten your own punishment, yet you stand your ground. Your stance on justice initially offends Sai on a personal level, as you shouldn't be the one to decide what is and isn't just. Yet, even still, this causes her to reflect on her own methodology for justice, and with that, she finally achieves a true bond with you, and is willing to sacrifice her own personal motives in order to help you pursue your own justice. A full understanding has been met, and your confidant ranking is maxed out. Joker's ultimate task is to fully bring someone to understand him in a single day, and it's a clear mark of the kind of person he's developed into. That is how you write a character arc for a silent protagonist. Yet, still, he seems to be forgetting something. The suspicions were true in the end. Still, to think his true intention was to sell us out. All that's left is to figure out a way to hand it over. It's all up to you, leader. As he finally recalls his memory, Joker slides Sai a device, a simple phone. Sai has no clue what you mean at first, but as you continue to hint to her what's going on, she finally gets it. 
She does as told with the device, and you're left to sit alone in the interrogation room, Sai leaving and doing whatever you requested of her, which was showing the phone to a catchy who happens to be at the station. With that, she's gone. Yet, this is supposed to be the peak of the narrative, right? The game can't just end here, obviously. So, what happens next? Do you stay in prison for the rest of your life? Or, oh, wait. If everything is truly escalating, you'd imagine that the thieves may stage a true prison break. That's a bit extreme, but for Joker's sake, it's plausible. And with the approach of Akechi, the boy opening the door to your interrogation room, that prospect becomes increasingly obvious. Or is it? A single blue butterfly with a child's voice soars over you. This truly is an unjust game. Your chances of winning are slim to none. So, what will you do? Hmm, you may be wondering what happens next, right? Well, I'll tell ya. Huh? What are you? I owe you for all of this. Thanks. Have you finally pieced it all together? <laughs> Case closed. This is how your justice ends. Joker friggin' dies. Unlike the palace before it, Sai's Casino has a pretty fantastic design all around. Don't get me wrong, it's not... No, no, I'm not gonna skim over that. This is where the game reaches its peak. Even if Akechi's betrayal was obvious, which is the point, but we'll discuss that if I ever do a follow-up to this, it's such a fantastic moment for the two characters. I can't even go into what makes this moment so fantastic without spending an entire hour or two just dissecting everything that precedes this and that builds off of this encounter after. But just trust me when I say, this is glorious. You don't understand how many details I had to skip over in this synopsis because this arc is so densely packed with information and I'd be talking for at least another 30 minutes on those aspects alone. Your justice has caused you to reach the end of your journey, and even still, the story continues its fantastic voyage from this point onwards. But I can't talk about stuff past this point, so on to the gameplay! Unlike the palace before it, Sai's Casino has a pretty fantastic design all around. Don't get me wrong, it's not perfect, and it still falls into some of the usual trappings of earlier palaces, but overall this is a definite step above the rest. One thing to note is that this is the shortest palace in the game. There are few that even come close to being this brief, unless you consider the final portion of the game a palace. So yes, this one is pretty short, but the compact nature of it allows it to have some pretty consistently solid challenges and concepts. For instance, this palace has a strong focus on the concept of gambling, both figuratively and literally, though let's focus on the literal aspect for this section. The first instance you'll notice is down a few corridors, where you'll stumble across a lone guard with an intense red aura surrounding them. A simple mini-boss, nothing new, right? Well, it seems that way at first, however, you get a proper, non-linear option here. After all, forcing you to fight an intense shadow like that wouldn't be right, so you get to make a gamble here either risk fighting the shadow head-on and go right up the stairs to your destination, 
or seek out a side path in order to sneak around the guard and ambush him. This is a basic risk versus reward dynamic, but it works really well in order to establish the vibe of this palace. Just like a casino, you know? Now, this next note I'm going to mention is technically a remnant of the story I hadn't mentioned before, but there's a reason I saved it for now, and that's the poker chip system. From the start, you're given a card that's meant to track how many poker chips you've earned throughout the casino, and you're given an initial loan from the get-go just to give you some early funds. These coins can also be used to buy prizes in the form of weapons and items, which honestly isn't super useful, but it's an option that's definitely appreciated. This is a simple way to demonstrate basic progression within the palace, and is a perfect visual to add to the theme of this being one massive gamble. Each major challenge within the palace serves to at least double your earnings, and gives a proper explanation for why you'd partake in these often rigged trials. Want to go higher? You've got to beat side or own game. I'll be mentioning the chip progression as we move from puzzle to puzzle, because the payoff is definitely worthwhile. The first challenge you encounter is that of the dice game, where it quickly becomes apparent that the odds are rigged against your bets every time. Sai is making it look like a fair playing field, but is playing dirty behind the scenes. So, what do you do? Simple. You kill her. You rob her blind and kick her down the stairs. You fix the game so you're guaranteed the win. <laughs> yeah, that. You'll end up entering a vent into the backstage corridors, where the design is somewhat linear yet still has enough space, as well as the appropriate enemy patterns, to allow the player to either ambush each enemy if they wish, or to skip past them when they see fit. There are a handful of side areas to venture off into as well, each having a small but useful reward for players willing to take their time. Oh, and just a side note, but when you open locked doors in this palace, look, the animation doesn't take 20 seconds this time. See, this is the real reason this palace is god tier. This entire video is actually a sham. I just wanted an excuse to talk about the door speed. Get bamboozled, you complete moron. So you rig the dice game and give it another shot. And without fail, you get jackpot after jackpot. After the obnoxious losing streak from earlier, this is an insanely satisfying reward. Even if it's only one small challenge in the grand scheme of things, each small victory is bringing you closer to your end goal. The next challenge places you in a room lined with rows and rows of slot machines, each one presumably rigged in the same way as the dice game. So, as per last time, you find the highest stakes slot machine in the room, and you're tasked with rigging it in your favor once again. Now, if I'm gonna be completely honest, here's my biggest critique for this entire palace. Where's the button? There should be a button. Where's the button? Where's the button? I gotta find the red button. Where's the button? I need that button. Where are you, button? I found the button. So you rig that game as well, and you keep moving onward. A brief story hiatus is required to progress into the high limits floors of the palace, but once you've gotten that taken care of, you're given a look at your next pair of challenges, which are legitimately the final areas of this palace before the boss confrontation. Like I've said before, this is definitely the shortest palace in the game, but it's a treat nearly the whole way through. Nothing overstays its welcome, and it's constantly throwing new concepts and ideas your way. For example, our next puzzle of note will be the House of Darkness, and it's exactly what it sounds like, a maze you must navigate your way through in total darkness. Now, I've had a few people mention that this puzzle annoyed them half to death, and while I can somewhat understand why that'd be, I absolutely adored this maze. There are few, if any, sections of the game that actually give you an interesting use of the third eye ability, and this is the perfect use of a concept like that. When your regular eyes may fail you, you have to pull out that sixth sense. The maze is filled with enemies, and even your third eye still leaves the maze incredibly dark, so navigating it is a much more interesting challenge than most other portions of the game. And even when you get to the final door, it's locked. So you have to look around for another exit you might have missed, only to quickly spot a vent that you can weasel your way through. Once again, you cheat the system designed by the cheaters. Also, a fun little note is that if you'd already looked at that vent before checking the exit door, the dialogue will change to have them question why they didn't take that path to begin with. It's a small touch, but definitely entertaining. The maze continues for a little while longer, and there are plenty of sidetracks to give you some more optional loot, but you'll eventually reach the exit only to be met with another rigged victory line after you've already escaped the maze. So you find another route, the maze rigger calls you a bug, and then he gets jumped by a gang of teenagers. Um, hooray! You got your prize money! It's also important to mention that there's been a handful of mini-bosses up to this point, but each of them are at least distinct from one another, so they don't get monotonous unless you personally don't care for mini-bosses. In my experience, I appreciate the challenge, so it's always welcome. Finally, you're graced with the final trial of this palace, that being the battle arena. Three matches, 
each a supposedly one-on-one -on -one confrontation between Joker and a single shadow, something which the game hasn't made mandatory since the first fight in the game. This being at the climax of this game is perfect in my eyes, and really tests players on if they manage to keep their character well-rounded and worthy of that title of leader. You know, even if the enemies cheat and throw multiple opponents at you because they're dirty liars. Now, you want to see some simple but great game design right here? So, your first opponents will mainly only use physical attacks, which can often stack up damage on you if you don't have the right preparations to deal with that. However, I've negated to mention the actual shadows that appear in this palace up until now. While most are fairly unassuming and simple, with a few standout designs here and there, within the Maze of Darkness is a single persona you can capture if need be. That being Rangda. Rang, 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 Rangda? Rangda. This persona is the first shadow you can capture naturally within a palace with the ability to reflect physical. Now, this may seem broken for this portion because it sort of is, but that Rangda also comes with physical attacks of their own at the start, which your enemies are resistant to. So if you're going to use it, you have to balance knowing when to have it equipped or when to switch to another persona. Or you can rely on item usage when Rangda is by your side. Following that, your second enemy is a trio of Rangda, meaning if you manage to capture one of them prior, you now understand their own strengths and weaknesses and are able to take advantage of it immediately after using them to give yourself an advantage. And the final enemy rounds things out by being a large, powerful target who swings with both physical and elemental abilities. This is just a small set of gameplay quirks when you boil it down, but despite how simple it is, it adds this really engaging dynamic to the palace and its battles, where your own willingness to explore the palace and recruit new shadows can be effectively rewarded in some really clever ways later on. Do you... do you see now why I love this palace so much? Also, I need to slot this in here, but don't spend all your casino chips before you pay all 100,000 to Psy. This is a genuine design oversight, but if you get impatient and buy everything offered at the prize counter, you may have to grind out the dice game in order to reach the amount you need, or you'll have to revert your save. So yeah, don't. Anywho, your team by now will have reached 100,000 chips, and that means you have enough leverage to cross the bridge into the treasure's quarters. Well, at least that's what the game wants you to think. Shadow Psy suddenly appears on the intercom, congratulating you backhandedly before she takes a move that I swear is a reference to my 12-year-old brother and makes the new end goal 1 million poker chips. So, crap. We have one more super long puzzle after this, right? Was this just another red herring finish line like in so many palaces before? <laughs> nope. Q Goro Akechi, esteemed genius and top-tier phantom thief who has been scheming something of his own from the very start. And no, I don't mean that. To put it simply, he used the currency borrowing system of the palace in order to stock up on lent coins with an extra card he'd held onto from an earlier mini-boss. This allowed him to essentially collect an extra 900,000 chips for your group. Gaming size rigged system once again. This is more of a story beat than a gameplay one, but I had to mention this alongside the gameplay because it ties everything together so well. The characters using the rules we know were set in place to abuse the system in an incredibly clever way. So we reach the boss fight, the cutscene unveiling the arena to be a massive roulette wheel, especially fitting of the aesthetic so far. As Sai stands there, soon a monitor will appear on her turn, stating whatever is at risk of this gamble, because it is one. The gimmick of this fight is the allure of chance, the player being given the option to bet on the roulette for either high payoff with high risk, or low payoff with low risk. In the first phase of the fight, Sai is very clearly cheating and aligns all your choices with a glass window. But after you call her out and have Ryuji use a sniper? The gambling system works just as intended. Admittedly, this system could be a lot more fleshed out and actually interesting, considering it does boil down to a regular fight. Except that if you hit her while the wheel is spinning, she'll basically murder you. But, I feel like the concept of this fight alone makes it one of the more memorable ones. Now, Ozzy, you may be asking, didn't you complain last time that Okumura didn't get a transformation? Sai didn't transform, we can see that right in front of us. So why the double stand- Wait for it! There it is! I would save this for the aesthetics portion, but for the sake of time, can we talk about how metal this transformation is, both literally and figuratively? The insane manic side of her personality that manifests as this offshoot Silent Hill monster with a massive blade and arm cannons that are ready to tear you apart at any second, regardless of the cost. This is someone who clearly won't hold back, and just by her design alone you can feel it. 
Also, nipple spikes. I feel inclined to mention nipple spikes. I don't have anything to say about them, but, you know, nipple spikes. This isn't the best boss fight in the game, in my opinion at least, but it's definitely one that stands out and will always linger in my memory. Oh, and one last note on the boss, but it actually changes pace if you only have Joker in your party when fighting her. She simply gets guilted into playing fair due to Futaba's mockery and transforms on the spot. Again, this is a small and rarely seen facet of the fight, but it shows some major attention to detail from the devs, as Joker wouldn't be able to send anyone to resolve the issue otherwise. To round out the gameplay segment, you return to where it all began, a nearly identical recreation of the opening scene of the game, only this time with a fuller context of the situation. You'll likely notice how much smoother your grasp of the movement mechanics are now, and how in tune you are with the gameplay as a whole, and that serves as its own sort of setup and payoff that was, at least in my case, extremely satisfying and rewarding. Arsene is back again once more, you make your grand escape through the palace, and then you get shot in the face by a rat. So that's all the noteworthy gameplay covered. Now, what do I have to say about the aesthetics of this palace? Uh... Screw the format, I need to gush about this as soon as possible! The aesthetic design and symbolic nature of this palace is mind-blowing. Genuinely, as I was revisiting the game in order to write down notes about the plot and gameplay, I couldn't help but jot down tons of anecdotes about how gorgeous and densely packed with symbolism this palace was. First, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. No, not you. Never you! You get out of here! Um... Yeah, if any of you see Giram and Kala at, like, a Denny's parking lot sometime soon, please tell him I didn't mean it. Whims of Fate is the main theme of this palace, and let me get the bad news out of the way. It is the only theme within this palace, so there's no alternative version of this song. Now, let me discuss the rest of the news regarding this song. Whims of Fate is an utter bop, plain and simple. The moment it starts, it invokes this jazzy pep that most other palace themes can't match, the closest being Price, which is another certified banger, but I digress. This is also the only palace theme to have lyrics, and Lin's vocal performance is fantastic as always, with her powerful, soulful bars lining the themes of this palace and its rulers with every lyric spoken. There absolutely couldn't have been a better song for this palace, and while it is arguably a bummer that there isn't a second theme within this palace, it doesn't need one if this is what we're left with. The palace is short enough anyhow, so it's understandable. Moving on to discuss the actual look of the palace, it's beyond gorgeous. It has this often present neon aesthetic with strong hues of purple backed by shades of red, yellow, green, blue, orange, pink, white, the entire rainbow is present here, and it all shines in this super flashy way that always catches my eye. This is all contrasted with the backroom corridors of the palace, which shifts from the rainbow lights and showy design of the gambling rooms, and instead show a more drably, cold, and practical look behind the curtains of Sai's palace. Instead of being a paradisiacal light show for you to be entranced by, the backrooms remove the facade. Everything is spelled out plain as day as the walls are lined with signs and stickers detailing Sai's inner thoughts and feelings. Success. Enemy, enemy, winner take all. These messages alone show how much this feels like a game to her. In the front, she puts on a face and a show, but behind the scenes, she has nothing to hide and this details her two-faced nature perfectly. I don't necessarily need to go too in-depth with a lot of the puzzles as they all push the same point that she'll take any means necessary to guarantee yourself a win, but I think they all work well enough for what they are. I also need to mention just how accurate this palace is to real high-end casinos visually and gameplay-wise in terms of rigging things out of your favor. So to prove it, me and my friend Asher decided to visit one just for the sake of demonstrating. Enjoy. Joe. Uh, hey, Ash. Yeah. So, uh, you just woke up, I presume. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I am currently in Florida, and you're in North Carolina. <laughs> However, I do need to ask this. Uh, -huh. uh how far is the nearest casino from where we live? <laughs> like 129 miles from you all right yeah i don't think we can do this bit if we're gonna go to one now i could make this a more structured segment where i break down how each aesthetic choice adds to the symbolic depth that lies within this palace and while i would do that i've been talking so long just let me gush for a sec all right I love how when you get to the higher floors where the gambling takes place, not only do the flashy lights get brighter and flashier, but also the intensity of the falling playing cards gets more and more major. 
Also, did I forget to mention, it's raining playing cards? I love how when you break open the vases and ornaments across the palace, it has a little burst of cards for that extra impact. And when you break those, you can sometimes get extra chips to trade in at the prize counter as well. I love how willpower cuts in the moment you enter the battle arena and how it really makes you feel like this is going to be a tournament challenge worth caring about. I love how the guards have their buff little bodyguard outfits and giant batons that make them look so goofy and the waitress ones have their little trays and bunny outfits yet still chase after you and are scary as heck. I love how the dice game and slot game have decorations telling of their style, dice lining the walls of one while giant slots set on the ground and walls of the ladder, with the giant neon sign saying 777 just begging for you to win that jackpot, and the corridors are made out of slot machines and have big spinning golden chandeliers above it, and... And I love the sign at the end of the palace where it says victory or defeat in big letters and basically spells out the dilemma of how that story arc closes out. I love how when you fight enemies in battle, it adds this mystical purple hue to the background, but the cards now swirl around you menacingly like they're in a twister. And then I, I, I love the big pile of coins that drop when you beat the slot machine. That felt so cool. Oh, and how the bridge at the end was like a judge's scale, both fitting into how she's a prosecutor, yet also how she thinks she'll be the judge of your fate. But also visually, it just looks so awesome as it goes. And, and can we talk about Sai's costume? This excessively fancy and promiscuous dress that both strikes a lure, yet a sense of authority over you, all topped with a big ol' hat and dark eyeliner that so perfectly contrasts with her striking yellow eyes in such a good way that also matches the flowers on her hat, and I am just... And the roulette wheel and the boss fight is just so rad, and her boss design, ah! I love everything about the design of this palace. I just... My brain is going a mile a minute, and I can't stop finding things to compliment about it. My soul can't handle this! Heck, I could go off for 30 minutes alone about how the fences next to the bridge at the end are held up by spinning cards! Ah! I need to move on! I can't do this! Man, I love Persona 5. You feel me? Is this palace perfect? No. Heck no. I don't even believe that something can be perfect. Expecting a game or any part of one to be perfect is just setting your expectations to unreasonable levels. However, in my eyes, this portion of the game has this undying trifecta of quality that I can't simply ignore, and that slots it into the top spot for me. It is the main highlight of a game filled with hundreds and thousands of highlights, and I can appreciate it for that. Let's talk about criticism for a second though, shall we? Persona 5 isn't the best game ever. In fact, I don't even believe in the concept of a best game ever. Same thing applies to the idea of perfection. That's not the point of this video. This is just me showing my appreciation for a piece of art that I adore. This game means a lot to me and practically encapsulates the exact kind of story that hits home personally for me. There's no need to say this game is overrated or this game is underrated because different games affect us differently as people. That's just how art works. So respect one another, guys. We are all trying our best in life, and being able to spread an optimistic outlook is way more satisfying than tearing down everything you can nitpick. And yes, this is coming from the guy who made the video about Space Palace Mino-like, but as I said there, and I'll repeat again, I don't hate that palace. There isn't a single portion of this game that I don't enjoy overall, and being able to gush about something that means so much to me is just as important as criticizing the bad. A good balance is important, so me making this video is kind of like me bringing order back to this channel, I suppose. If this isn't your favorite palace, then good for you. If this is your favorite palace, good for you as well. It's all just opinions. And heck, I want to see your opinions on what is your favorite and why, because that stuff is super interesting to me and I love hearing different perspectives on all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, this is how I feel, and I hope you appreciated hearing my thoughts. So to close things out, I adore this palace. It's fun, it's engaging, its beauty is felt in spades, and it feels integral to the story of this game landing so effectively. So on that note, thank you all so much for watching this and hearing me out. I love this palace, I love this game, and I love you all. Unless you disagree with me, then you're wrong! Wow, I'm finally done, huh? It seems like it's impossible for me to make a video shorter than 30 minutes, but I appreciate all of you who have stuck through this video and the ones prior. It means way more to me than you'd expect, and seeing all your reactions always brings me a ray of joy. You guys like the new avatar? Yeah, it's... 
So much different, I know. Though, for any of you who actually noticed, I hope you like the slicker look of this video and my stick figures. I only have so much drawing talent, but these things come naturally to me, so you've sometimes just gotta work with what you have. Oh yeah, this video is sponsored by me editing for six days straight with a little interruption. Aside from my Animal Crossing binge sessions, but we don't count that. In regards to communicating with me, I'm actually super active on the community tab for this channel, so check that out if you get the chance. I usually drop little teasers and updates for what I'm working on in the future. Or if that's not your speed, I'm also super active on my Discord server, linked in the description. Which is honestly way more fun to be in than I ever expected. Seriously, it'd be awesome to see you guys there. Or you can just comment on this video since I read each and every comment when possible. Yes, all of them. Even the deleted ones. You ain't slick. Thanks as always to my pals for helping me proofread the script and give some editing advice. You're cool as always. And props to Meloichi specifically for, as per usual, giving me some stupidly cursed ideas for video edits. Oh, and same to Asher for letting me harass him at 10 in the morning. Thanks also go out to Michelle, or Seniorish, who I'm contractually obligated to tell you to subscribe to, otherwise she's gonna put Haru even lower in her tier list next time, and I can't bear to see that. Oh, and a quick side note, but if I were to open up a Patreon, would any of you be interested in supporting it? I want a consensus first before I actually go through with anything, so feel free to share your thoughts. Also feel free to share your thoughts on this palace as a whole. My word isn't law, so if you disagree, I'm definitely open to hearing why. Finally, Persona 5 Royal is coming out days from now, circa the day I'm uploading this, of course. I already know plenty about the game, but I can't wait to properly get my hands on it and drown myself in the sound of my PS4's stupidly loud fan for the next month or two. Maybe I'll even have some thoughts to share on the game in the future, hmm? I don't have much more to say, but if you enjoyed this video, it seriously helps to share this to others who'd appreciate it as well. Come on, I know most of you are bored due to recent dilemmas that I can't really name specifically, uh, but there's no harm in it. But yeah, that's all I have to say. Stay safe, do your homework, and hug your pets. They need love too. Please don't troll me online for this interruption, okay?